morning. I'd like to welcome you to our our spring version of the Everett Post Conflict Reconstruction Speaker Series. Today actually marks uh, a big day for us. It's actually our our fifth year for this speaker series, and the speaker series was actually created uh, through the initiative of one of our distinguished law alums, Judge David Everett and his family, who was actually uh, also a, an Army Reserve Colonel who spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, just so happens we have another distinguished alumni here uh, as our guest speaker, Colonel James McKee, who is a graduate, well, he and his wife are graduates of Syracuse University, a graduate of SU Law. Uh, he entered the service in 1989 as an infantryman, a paratrooper. Uh, he's been assigned to uh, the 10th Mountain Division, uh, the 16th Corps Support Group, 1st Armored Division, 1st Infantry Division, NATO Headquarters, Kosovo, U.S. Army Europe, uh, Multinational Division, North Iraq, and U.S. Forces Afghanistan. Um, as a JAG attorney, Colonel McKee has served in many positions, uh, including uh, legal assistance attorney, trial counsel, trial defense counsel, chief of claims, Officer in charge of the Swineford Legal Center, Brigade Judge Advocate. Uh, he currently serves as the program manager for the Special Victims Council, uh, where he supervises over 100 special victims prosecutors. Uh, most recently, he served as, in the past year, as a Deputy Staff Judge Advocate for U.S. Forces Afghanistan, uh, General Allen and General Dunford. He served in four combat tours to Iraq and Afghanistan and two peacekeeping tours in, in, the, in the Balkans. Obviously, he has a wealth of experience in all aspects of military law, particularly operational law to include lethal and non-lethal targeting. And today's lecture will focus on his recent experience as a deputy staff judge advocate of U.S. Forces Afghanistan from 2012 to 2013. With that, I'll clear over there. Thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. Um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Banks and the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism for inviting me here today. I'd also like to sp send a special thank you to Ms. Lisa Pritchard for taking care of me and, and arranging uh, everything to make it easy to be here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, two themes throughout the, uh, th throughout the presentation. One is uh, messaging or strategic messages or information operations or propaganda, however you want to categorize uh, what we put out uh, in terms of our, our messages, whether it's the Army, whether it's the, the, uh, the administration, whether it's the other side. And I want to also talk about relationships. And so those are the two things we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly on the bilateral security agreement. We're going to, we're going to get to that, but, but in order to get to that, um, we we'll have to talk about a few other things. So the bilateral security agreement, and I'll refer to it as the BSA, um, will replace the dip note of 2002, known as the U.S. SOFA, in order to set the framework for the U.S. presence in Afghanistan in 2015. The purpose of the agreement is to set the foundation for the U.S. and Afghanistan to continue to foster close cooperation to strengthen the security and stab stability of Afghanistan, to contribute to regional and international peace and security, and enhance the ability of Afghanistan to, de to deter against its sovereignty, security, and territorial integrity. The U.S., un under the BSA, the Bilateral Security Agreement, will advise and assist and train the security forces of Afghanistan and conduct counterterrorism. A list of activities to go along with that will be training, equipping, funding, intelligence operations in order to carry the, the things that are found in the bilateral security agreement out. Before we turn to the BSA articles and go into more depth, I would like to set the stage with some background information. Some of you will know some of the history that we talk about in some of the documents and some of you will not know and I apologize if I uh, go too far down a road um, and you're more familiar with this topic um, but I think it's it's good to talk about all the things that make up uh, the, doc the foundational documents and, and how we get to the BSA. <coughs> so 
we're, we're going to talk about first is the critical documents between the two nations that formed, that came prior to the BSA. We'll talk about some history and we'll talk about um, the rules that commanders operate um, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, now, I'm wearing my military uniform, so there's the Army's position and there is my personal position, okay? I promise you that I will speak plainly, directly, okay? Uh, I will uh, not give you talking points, okay? Uh, and, but I will give you my personal opinion, and I also will talk about what the Army's is. So when I say this is my personal opinion, please don't write it down and say the Army's opinion is this, okay? It's Jay McKee's personal opinion, okay? If I say it's the armies, it's the armies, and you can quote it as the armies. Um, but if you have any questions or any issue or there's any, uh, any, um, you know, any misunderstanding, please ask me and I will let you know. Okay, but first what I want to talk about is what I do for the army now for a few minutes. On the 14th August of 2013, the Secretary of Defense said, told the services, you will stand up. Special Victims Council for Victims of Sexual Assault in the Army. So if you're a victim of sexual assault in the Army, you get your own attorney. You have to request your own attorney. So we provide advice and representation to victims of sexual assault. On 1 November, we stood up the program, and by 1 January, 1 January we were fully operational. Presently, we have 81 council across the globe, and that's everywhere. That's in Europe, that's in Afghanistan, that's in Kuwait. That's all throughout the United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. We, pro we provide victims of sexual assault with an attorney. And you can say to yourself, well, why would you do something like that? Why do we need both a prosecutor, a defense counsel, and now we have another attorney who's a third-party attorney going to be involved in this adversarial system? And the reason we have it is because the victim, victim's interest is not always aligned with the government. And I'll give you an example. Sometimes the government says to uh, the defense, to the defense and to the judge, yes, you can have the victim's medical records or her mental records or her psychological records. Or the government will say, yeah, we don't mind if you talk about that victim's past sexual history. And so when those interests diverge, then the victim, victim's attorney can enter into court, argue before court, uh, provide motions and briefs, and, and represent zealously that victim in court. And so that's why we have it. And also under the, vic uh, there's a Federal Victims Rights Act, um, they're allowed to uh, talk about offers to plead guilty by an accused. They're also uh, allowed to enter into clemency matters. So when someone's convicted and they go before the general court martial convening authority who decides clemency, they can also submit those clemency matters. So that's, that's what the program does. So, everybody remembers this famous picture, correct? The end of the World War II, right? It was a joyous occasion. It's a famous photo. And I'm going to read from you a description of this photo from a bastion of liberal feminism known as the U.S. Naval Institute, okay? So, it's a little joke, but... <laughs> All right, so... This is the description of this photo. Sailor George Mendoza halted his steps just before running into Miss Greta Zimmer. His upper torso's momentum swept her over. The motion force bent Greta backward and, and to her right. He took over Greta's slender frame. His right hand cupped her slim waist. He pulled her inward toward his lean and muscular body. This is not a smutty novel, okay? So let's just, <laughs> this is not smut, okay? It sounds like a little bit of smut. Her initial attempt to physically separate her person from the intruder proved a futile exertion against the dark uniform man stronghold. With her right arm pinned between their two bodies, she instinctively, instinctively brought her left arm and clenched fist upward in defense. The effort was an unnecessary. He never intended to hurt her. As their lips locked, his left arm supported by her neck, his left hand turned backward and away from her face offered the single gesture of restraint, caution, or doubt. The struck pose created an oddly appealing mixture of brutish force, caring embrace, and awkward hesitation. He didn't let go. As he continu continued to lean forward, 
she lowered her right arm and gave over to her pursuer. So this was a sexual assault. This sailor was drunk. He pursued her across the plaza, okay? And that is the story behind that, that picture. So, my point, relationships and messaging, right? So here you have a bad relationship. It's not really even a relationship. It's a sexual assault, okay? And you also have messaging. So what you thought this picture was for all of these years, for 60 years, um, stood for actually something the exact opposite, okay? And so what's even more interesting is this woman right here is his date, okay? Rita Petri, that's his date, who later became his wife, okay? So on a date, this guy's sexually assaulting this woman, other woman, pursuing her across the way, and they get married. So bad, oops, sorry, <laughs> so bad, rela oh, sorry. bad relationship, right? Good relationship that goes through badness and goodness, right? This is a, I'm sure that he got an earful after this, right? So it's a, right now is a bad, bad timing, you know, bad, a bad, uh, bad relationship. So we're going to talk about relationships and messaging. Same thing with Afghanistan. So what? You have those who say you have to end the war, you have to get out of the war, all right? We spent a lot of money. Um, it's, it's wasteful. It, we're not going to make a difference there. We need to get out. Okay, and then you have other people who say we spent a lot of blood and treasure there. We have to make a difference. We've made a lot of progress, and we have to stay. So you have those two themes and those two messages that are out there strategically, okay? You can call it whatever you want. And then you have relationships, and we're going to talk about relationships. So Afghanistan by the numbers. And in terms of relationships, if you look at our relationships with Germany, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, um, and even SU Law School. I will tell you, back in, uh, I'm sorry I got a little bit ahead of myself, but in SU Law School, when I was here, the Army could not interview judge advocates, attorneys, to go into the judge advocate because of the Solomon Amendment, because of don't ask, don't tell. So I had to leave here and go to Fort Drum because recruiters were not allowed to come to the law school and talk. And so you talk about a relationship, so you can say, well, you can get mad about that, or you can be angry that, you know, hey, my chosen profession was not hot, well, held in high regard here at the law school, or you can have a relationship with SU. My wife went here, graduated. My brother went here and graduated. My sister-in-law graduated from here. My son attended this institution before he transferred, and my daughter has applied for admission in the fall. So I love SU but it's all about relationships, okay? So I think I've beaten that one. All right, so next slide, by the numbers. 9-11, 3,280 people were killed. Cost and economic loss was 123 billion. Insurance paid out because of 9-11 was 9.3 billion. Corruption in Afghanistan cost the U.S. per year 4 billion. Afghan produced a record level of Opium last year, despite the U.S. spending $7 billion to eradicate it. Cultivation of opium rose 36% last year, and a farmer gets between $160 to $200 per one kilogram of dry opium, and a wheat farmer gets 41 cents. U.S. personnel killed in Afghanistan, 2,306. Wounded in Afghanistan, 19,638. Number of Afghans killed since 2006, 14,728. The money that we have spent in Afghanistan is $516.9 billion. Coalition troops that serve side by side with uh, Afghans, 139 of them have been killed by their Afghan brother, okay, who they're serving alongside. 158 have been wounded. Okay, bright spots. Bright spots in Afghanistan. 200 villages last year got cleared by the Afghan National Security Forces. They disabled 600 IEDs. The Afghan Air Force is actually flying missions. When I arrived there in July of 2012, they weren't flying missions. They are flying missions to include EVAC missions. The 
AFNS leads 97 of all security operation. That means that they're in the lead and they do 90% of their own training. 80% of the local population has access to health care within 10 kilometers of where they live. There are, there are, in 2001, there are 900,000 children that went to school in Afghanistan, to, okay? And that was in 1991. Most of those were boys. And today, 8 million children go to school, and one-third of them are women. Okay? So, bright spots for women. 21 and 69 women are in the upper and lower houses of Afghanistan. Three women Afghans are ministers in the government. There's one woman who is a provincial government governor, and, that, and that's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty powerful position. There are 142 women who are lawyers that are judges in the system. There are 1,500 Afghan women who fight in the Afghan security uh, forces. There are 3,200 women 300, there are 3,200,000 girls or young women in school today. And there are 20,000 women in colleges today in Afghanistan. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what a judge advocate. So you're a judge advocate, you're in wherever you are, so what are you doing? So this is just kind of to lay the groundwork a little bit. So we're going to talk about a little bit of history, just a little bit of history. So you have, these are all the tribal areas. You have the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, the, the Uzbeks, and they're all different colors, okay? You have China, you have the Stans, you have Iran, you have Pakistan, you have Russia, you have India. And the, these are all people who have an interest in Afghanistan and either upsetting the power or not upsetting the power. And then you have their, their society, which is all tribal, and it's all based on all these alliances, and that's why you had the loyal jerga, why President Karzai said, I'm not going to sign the BSA unless the loyal jerga, all these tribal affiliations, come in here and tell me that I can sign it. Okay? So you have all these things. So as a judge advocate, when we're trying to get stuff out, it's called lines of communications or locks, okay? We're getting all of our stuff out through Pakistan. Well, we killed the wrong people in drone strikes. Afghanistan gets, or Pakistan gets mad and says, you're not coming through the border. They also say, you're not, you're not paying us enough money to get your stuff through the border, so we're also going to shut down the border, so you can't get out. So in order to get your stuff out of Afghanistan, you've got to go through the north. And there's a thing called the Salon Tunnel. The Salon Tunnel basically needed to be repaired. So as a judge advocate, there's statutes about money and it's time, purpose, and amount, or the color of money. So you have to have the right time, the right fiscal year money, you have to have the right spending amounts, okay, and you have to have the right purpose. So you get a commander and he comes in, he says, Commander's Emergency Relief Funds. He says, I want to spend this amount of money to repair this tunnel. And you tell him, sorry sir, you don't have the authority to spend that kind of money. And he goes, well, I'll split the project in half, right? Project splitting, that's against the law. You can't do that. So you tell him, you can't do that. You've got to go back to Congress and get the right authority. So that's what you do as a judge advocate. You tell the commander, you can't project split. you got to do it right. you got to go back to Congress. Yes, it's going to delay it. Yes, we'll probably be repairing the tunnel in the middle of winter, okay? But it's going to get done. And so we did all those things at US-4A. The tunnel got repaired and our stuff moves out now through the north. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is the Iron Amir, okay? The Iron Amir did, and I'm going to get this wrong, the Pashtunization of Afghanistan, okay? Ethnic cleansing. So here are all the Pashtuns, and what he did, the Iron Amir did, is he moved everybody out, and this became, you know, where the Pashtuns lived. So the British fought three wars. And they fought three wars, and at the end of that war, the Iron Amir decided along here, along this line, the Duran line, that that's where Afghanistan would be, okay? The problem is he, he split all of these tribes. And so this is one of those problems when you talk about, 
you know, all the people going back and forth and all the guerrilla operations and all the, uh, you know, all the Taliban moving back and forth, you know, and, and the problems in Pakistan, that's the reason right there, tribal affiliations. Okay, just so, just so that we, we understand that. And so it went to the British, and then the British gave it to Pakistan. And so when you talk about Karzai and, you talk, and he talks about all these foreign powers messing with Afghanistan and interfering in our sovereignty and our territorial integrity, this is part of that history. This is part of that history. Okay. All right. So, a judge advocate. What do we do? We try to provide candid, timely, and accurate advice, and we try to do the right thing. And I'll just give you another example. When we rolled into... Um, Iraq. We rolled into uh, 2004. Uh, we took over First Infantry Division. Took over Fourth Infantry Division's uh, space. We went into the Fourth Infantry Division's detention facilities. Those detention facilities were horrible. Okay, and they uh, and I'll talk about some of the stuff that they that happened before. But basically, the detainees would urinate in a bottle. Okay, and that's and they would in front of everybody, so the guard force. Their toilets were American toilets, so they go to the bathroom the Turkish way, okay? So they would stand on the toilets and they would, they would go to the bathroom. There was no showers, there was no fresh food, there were rats and there were mice in the facility. So what you do as a judge advocate, you go to your commander and you say, sir, your detention facilities violate the Geneva Conventions and you have to clean them up. Now he was a new commander. You know, the old commander was gone, the new commander came in. He had nothing to do with those old detention facilities. So basically he signs off, he acknowledges that you have told him that he is in violation of the law. You also tell him if he doesn't clean it up, you'll report him. Okay? And that's being candid, and that's what you have to do. That is your duty, because your duty is not to a person. My duty is not to a person. My duty is to the army and to the nation. Okay, so that's what we do. That's our job is to do as judge advocates. Okay, so our job is also to make sure that commanders understand what we're doing. This is combat operations. So as a judge advocate, you're, you're teaching classes and you're telling the rules of engagement for commanders when you're in combat operations. So you switch from, you know, breaking, destroying, and annihilating your enemy to coin operations, which is train, advise, and assist and also winning the hearts and the population mind. Because if you act like this when you're trying to convince people that you're providing safe, a safe and secure environment, you're going to lose. You're going to lose winning the hearts and the mind of the people. So two different mindsets that soldiers have to be involved in and what you have to get those soldiers and that commanders to understand. And it's, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. Okay, so another thing about Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, you have in Afghanistan you have two commands. You have the United States and you have NATO. NATO has 26 countries. Up here where I worked, I worked for the commander of US4A and who was also the commander of ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, okay? So two commanders. General Dunford wears two hats. He puts on his NATO authority hat and he puts on his U.S. hat, and whatever he needs to do, he can put on either hat and make those things happen. Okay, so if he can't do it with his NATO hat, he puts on his U.S. hat, and, and that's how you get the mission accomplished. He also has to consider all these 26 nations and all their different national caveats. And so what you have is uh, you have different rules, different laws, different pots of money, and you have these commands. If you want, you can find the actual chain of command and all the things on the Internet if you want. Um, but I wasn't going to post it because it really shouldn't be posted. But if you're curious, you can go and Google the, uh, the actual organization. So you have two legal staffs, and this commander, along with NATO, and they're, everybody's together. So you got a U.S. side and you got a NATO side. And everybody just kind of puts on their two different hats. And sometimes it's a U.S. guy at the top, and sometimes it's a NATO guy at the top. So Afghanistan's divided into about five regions. So Kabul's run by the Turks. The North is run by the Germans, and the Italians and the Spanish run the West. Okay. All right, then our mission statement. Two different missions. 
So the ISAF mission is to reduce the capability and the will of the insurgency and to train the Afghan security forces. So that's what the NATO side's doing. And the U.S. side, okay, basically is we're getting our stuff out of Afghanistan and we're repositioning our stuff in order to do train, advise, and assist um, the Afghan army and then to conduct counterterrorism. So we're shrinking our footprint, just like here in the United States or just like in Germany where they have what's called BRAC, where they close the bases and they consolidate the bases. Same thing's going on here, except the U.S. is doing one side of it and, and ISAF is concentrating on the security forces and training them. So two different missions. Okay, another example of operating in two different spheres. This is Kosovo back in 2003, and this is the two different mindsets that, that you as a judge advocate or you as the U.S. operates in these two different, two different worlds. Here's the U.S. The U.S. is telling the commander of the Kosovo Dubrava detention facility, okay, back in 2001 when the Serbs, we and the Serbs, the NATO and the Serbs agreed to close the ground safety zone which was inhabited by the UCPMB guerrillas, okay? Um, and they were coming across the border and they were causing a lot of problems um, for the Serbs and then they would hide back in the safety zone and then cross it back into Serbia and cause a lot of problems and kill, and kill people. And that, that was destabilizing the region. So what happened was we agreed that we were going to open a NATO detention facility and we we're going to put these guys in the NATO detention facility. So when we open it up, the U.S. comes and says, hey, oh, hey you, do you need some uh, shackles? We'll give you some shackles. So that's the start of it. And the commander here, he's a Brit. He says, no, I don't need shackles. And so i got to cover this face because it's a detainee. There's not a hood on him or anything like that. You can't show faces of detainees. That's against the law. Okay, so just if you're curious. So right now, we have guns. We have weapons. The U.S. has weapons. K-4 doesn't have weapons. And they have, they have dogs for the detainees. Now dogs, yeah, dogs are scary. But when you have lots and lots of de detainees, and a few dogs, it really doesn't matter. But it's two different mindsets about how you treat uh, or how you control people. You know, two different rules of engagement. So it's just a small example, but it's a, but it's a telling example. These guys aren't, you know, these guys don't need a gun. I mean, they're, they're not afraid. They have a few dogs. We're bringing a whole lot of detainees into the detention facility. And this is what it looks like. So here's the guard force. I lived over here with a bunch of people. These were all the detainees. Okay, and these guys were bad. These guys were bad and they were dangerous, okay? And all that separated was from barbed wire. But you have two different ways of doing business, okay? One with ammo, one without ammo. And that's just kind of how that you have to operate in these different elements. I was the only U.S. person at this facility. I was the only person with ammunition and a weapon. And you know where I put my ammunition and a weapon? I locked it up in the safe <laughs> because I didn't need it. Okay, because we, that's the way the NATO guys did business, and that was okay with me. I could deal with that, and that was all right, and we were safe, and we were fine. Just, just two different ways of, of rules of engagement and what you can do and how you handle uh, detainees. So, we're finally going to get to the documents. <clears throat> so, so, Resolution 1386 and 1413 authorized ISAF under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Okay, for the U.S. it was Article 51, which was self-defense. So that's how we entered Afghanistan. U.S. entered under Article 51 and ISAF entered under Chapter 7. Okay, relevant, a little bit relevant for our, de our discussion about the bilateral security agreement. The diplomatic note we're going to talk about the U.S. SOFA and what those things allowed us to do uh, governs the U.S. behavior. The military technical agreement that ISAF signed with the interim government governed how ISAF operated. And then you have the strategic partnership agreement of 2012, which laid the cornerstone and set the conditions for the bilateral security agreement and also designated Afghanistan as a major non-NATO ally. Okay, so the diplomatic note, the U.S. SOFA. Okay, a dip note, it's about four pages long. You think like it, it could be this, you know, huge document, 20, 30 pages spelling, about, spelling out how two countries can get along. 
It's literally four pages long. Exchange of letters. Uh, if you ever heard of exchange of letters, it's the same thing. It's where two countries exchange letters and it's two pages and they say, hey, this is what's going to happen and this is how, how we're going to operate with, with each other. So what that said in four pages, okay, the dip note said, free movement of forces. Okay, in order for us to conduct combat operations against our enemies, okay, we have to have freedom of movement in and out of Afghanistan and throughout Afghanistan, unimpeded movement, and you're going to give that to us. We're going to be able to wear our uniforms, carry our weapons. We're going to have exclusive jurisdiction over our personnel. So if our personnel do something bad to the people of Afghanistan, okay, or to a contractor or to a person in uniform, we're going to take jurisdiction over that person exclusively and we're going to punish them. You're not going to be allowed to have criminal prosecution rights over that person. And that's, that in some countries is the same, in some countries is different. Japan sometimes exercises jurisdiction over our people. So does Korea sometimes exercises jurisdiction over our people. So exclusive jurisdiction is not always the same from country to country under a SOFA. Okay. Our only limit to conduct combat operations is what the commander puts on you and says, hey, these are the rules that I want you to follow for these combat operations. You know, I don't want you to take down the house even if those bad guys are in there. Okay? I'm limiting your, your ability to do what you think is necessary. Okay? Those are called rules of engagement. Tax-free personnel. We don't pay any taxes. Okay? Everything that comes in and goes out and all the contracts that we sign are tax-free. We can enter into contracts that are governed by U.S. law. That's a big deal because we have to abide by what Congress says for time, purpose, and amount, and all the contracts that we enter in have to be competitively bid, and they have to go through a re re review process, and our contracts are going to be governed by our laws. We're going to be able to use whatever facility we want, and we're going to be able to build whatever facility we want. We're going to waive claims against each other because one sovereign does not sue another sovereign and one sovereign does, another, not, does not tax another sovereign. And finally, we're going to be able to set up internal support, which means we're going to be able to do, set up radio frequencies. We're going to have you know, armed forces network TV. We're going to have, to have uh, uh, movie theaters and we're going to have a post office. And we're going to conduct all those things to take care of all those people that are there with us. So that's the dip note. The dip note you're going to see looks very similar to, the, to some of the things in the bilateral security agreement. So now we're going to go to the military technical agreement. It was established by the UN Security 1386. Okay, it says necessary and proper. Remember, it's a chapter seven uh, peace enforcement mission, but it can do, the commander can do whatever he believes is necessary and proper to uh, carry out his mission. Same thing, freedom of movement, entry and exit, Afghanistan, in and out, uh, throughout, wear uniforms, carry weapons, develop infrastructure, same thing. Repair whatever you need and build whatever you need. Train and assist the future army. It carried out that the interim government was responsible for law and order. It exercised exclusive jurisdiction over their NATO personnel and the other countries that are in the coalition force because there's about 40 countries in ISAF, 40 to 50. Tax-free for, oh, tax for all personnel, okay? The ability to use and construct facilities, waive claims against each other, but here's really the key point. So if you have a dispute between uh, the interim government and President Karzai under the MTA, which is still in force right now, the ultimate arbitra arbitrator is General Dunford, the commander who wears both the U.S. hat and he wears the ISAF hat. So if President Karzai says, I think you're you know, doing something wrong and you're not following what you're supposed to be in Afghanistan, General Dunford can say, I don't really care what you think. I'm the final decider. Now he does, General Allen and General Dunford have never operated that way. Um, but they have that ability. And in terms of building relationships, you cannot operate that way. But under the MTA, it gives them that authority. I've ever, the 13 months I was there, I've never seen uh, either one of them ever go to the, the government of, um, of Afghanistan and say those things, you know, hey, I'm in charge, I'm the boss, and this is the way it's going to be. Never have I once saw them do that. But 
they have that trump card in there. Okay? They've never exercised it, um, but they have that ability. So now we're going to turn to the Strategic Partnership Agreement. So the Strategic Partnership Agreement was signed in like 2012. It is the foundational document for the Enduring uh, Partnership Agreement, the Strategic Partnership Agreement, in order to get us to the Bilateral Security Agreement. Okay? And so it's supposed to do th three things. It's supposed to promote shared democratic values. It's supposed to advance long-term security. It's supposed to reinforce security and cooperation and have social and economic development. And it's supposed to uh, strengthen Afghan institutions and governance. And finally, it designated uh, Afghanistan as a major non-NATO ally. So you have all these, all these things, and it's the cornerstone document. And so the administration, okay, this is now that we're going into my personal opinion, okay? So this is my personal opinion. The administration is saying this is what this document is for. It is going to set the conditions for us to enter into a strategic long-term par partnership um, in order for us to move into the future. But if you, if you, read, if you read the roadmap briefing, so, so you go to the press conference, you read the roadmap briefing, and it talks about those four principles about Afghanistan as they move along, but this is, these are the things that stand out to you in the briefing because they're repeated over and over again. They say, okay, it's a component to end the war in Afghanistan. It's going to bring the war to an end responsibly. I, I don't know about you, but I don't think the word war and responsible go together. They just, they just don't go together. <clears throat> I've been to a lot of places. I've been all over the Balkans. I've been to Turkey and, and seen ethnic cleansing um, in, in Kurdistan or well, I can't call it Kurdistan, in the east. Um, I've been through the Balkans with ethnic cleansing, Macedonia, I've been through Iraq and Afghanistan, and war is a very violent and th the last thing on earth that you ever want to see, and there's really nothing about it ending it responsibly. You either defeat your enemy, okay? You either agree to a peace treaty, okay? Um, defeat your enemy, agree to a peace treaty, or you... Uh, um, there's, you know, I don't know how you just kind of walk away from a war. There has to be some kind of ending with your adversary. You have to have some kind of final, finalization of a war. And we don't have that. We didn't have that in Iraq, and we didn't have that in Afghanistan, in my personal opinion. So we talk about how do you end this war responsibly? And it talks about even in Iraq, where anybody would state that the U.S. is no longer at war, there are occasional ca acts of violence. I think Iraq would say that we have moved into a different type of security environment where they don't consider themselves at war either. I'm confident that based on how we've been building up the Afghan security forces and the capacity that the Taliban can't return and kind of take over the whole country that existed in the 90s. And so just last month, the Iraqi prime minister says, I will not give up Anbar province to al-Qaeda, which has reconstituted in Iraq and right now, the Iraqi army is shelling the city of Fallujah, and there right now is they're fighting for their lives in Fallujah as to who's going to win. Is it going to be Al Qaeda back in Iraq and Anbar province, or is it going to be the Iraqi army? Iraq is still at war. There are still huge levels of violence. So to me, there's to me my personal opinion. There's a disconnect between, you know, what we believe the strategic partnership is going to, uh, what it stood for, and and in terms of how we get to where we're supposed to go. And it comes back to relationships. If you want to influence a, you know, influence a country or be there for a while or make things different, you have to be there for a long time. And, um, and I think this is proof principles that when we left Iraq and we did not sign a bilateral security agreement with Iraq, this is what has happened. You know, we are not there. We're not on the ground. We're not training them. We're not helping them. We're not equipping them. We're not having any type of influence over where Iraq moves uh, into the, in, into where they, you know, into where we believe our strategic interests are. And, and that's not to say, you know, I'm not a believer in, like, Americanization of, 
of any place. I believe a society should be what societies are and whatever they're going to be. I don't think we should go in there and have a McDonald's on the corner. They don't need to have, you know, what we believe is freedom and democracy. That's not our role, okay? They need to have their own society and build their own principles and things like that. But if you enter into a relationship and you move into that, to me, my personal opinion is you have to stay in order to see that through. So they got major non-NATO uh, designation out of it. So what does that mean? So what does that mean? All that means is you get stuff, okay? You get more stuff. You get, uh, you get more uh, defense equipment. You get more uh, financing. You get space technology. You just basically have access to more military gear um, for, for Afghanistan. And the key for this is that gear, for the most part, is, is U.S. and NATO gear. So Afghanistan uses a lot of Russian stuff. They fly Russian planes, fly Russian helicopters, but here they're going to start moving towards what we have for NATO. Okay. So, little Afghan history. You didn't know this, but our first invasion of Afghanistan happened in 1833 by Joshua Harlan, who was a Pennsylvania Quaker who went over to Afghanistan to be the king of Afghanistan. So, no kidding. <laughs> So this guy went to Afghanistan, and he said, I'm going to be the king. So he went over there. He actually he entered into some military, uh, military stuff. He actually got to be the, what's known as the Prince of Gore, uh, who's, or the governor of Jer Jasrata and uh, whatever you say. I can't, I can't really say that. But until the British kicked him out. So that's, our, that's the first, the first uh, U.S. contact with Afghanistan that we know of. So then we have 1910, diplomatic relationships uh, established. And then we have the chief engineer was an American, A.C. Jewett. And this guy developed, uh, they built dams and they, things like that. And he was, he was the chief engineer to the king uh, of Afghanistan. And then you have all of these visits by pretty high-level personnel. You had Nixon, Agnew. Um, we, had, we signed cultural exchanges with Afghanistan. Uh, we put $500 million way back when. That's a lot of money into Afghanistan. We had the Peace Corps there, the American Boy Scouts, USAID. We had a really uh, good relationship with them. President Kennedy, the, Sh the uh, President Kennedy, the, Sh the King Shaw visited Kennedy. Uh, Eisenhower went there. Um, they even, the Prime Minister of Afghanistan, even addressed Congress back then. I mean, a lot of people don't know this, so we were pretty had a lot of influence on them, even to the point where they drafted a new constitution that gave democratic free elections, a parliament, civil rights, women's liberation, and universal suffrage back in 64. So this guy, King Shaw, basically had this, we had this long-term relationship, and he ends up doing all these great things. And people don't know that. So, so here, this is our this is our influence on our relationship with Afghanistan over time. I'm not saying we did that. It was because of us that he came around to that point. But I'm sure it had something to do with it. Okay? But then what you had interfering with it was the Cold War. You had Russia and the U.S. And you had this. And both sides want to win. Okay? They want to win. And, and Russia did win. And they had a coup in 73. Then later they had the Russians uh, overthrew the communist uh, government there. Um, and then you had the Taliban move in. And then we aligned ourselves with the Taliban. And we provided them weapons. Um, so, uh, relationships. Okay? Themes. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the BSA. Okay? And we've got, still got plenty of time here to talk about the BSA. All right. So, as a judge advocate, in my office, there were a lot of different people who worked with a lot of different agencies, and we worked on the bilateral security agreement. I'm going to actually tell you what's in there, okay? So you have your draft document. Department of State drafts it, and it goes over to Department of Defense. It also goes over to Central Command, which is in Florida, CENTCOM, okay? Central Command in Florida. There are a bunch of lawyers there, a bunch of lawyers there you know, diplomats, lawyers. Then it goes over to the U.S. Embassy there. They got their own ambassador. They have their own ambassador there. Um, then it goes to U.S. 4A, okay, where I worked. They, got, they have lawyers there. They have commanders, commanders, 
are interested in the BSA because the biggest stakeholder for the bilateral security agreement is the Department of Defense because we're the ones who are going to train, advise, assist, and do counterterrorism. So right there, uh, you have a lot of uh, officers and lawyers and commanders in here. And so this document goes around and around. You have lots of meetings. It goes through lots of drafts, just like you would write a paper here. You go to your advisor, they would change it. And then when they get a draft that they like, they send it to Jeroa, okay, or, uh, Afghanistan, the government of Afghanistan. And then they go into rounds of negotiations. And they had like four rounds of negotiations. And as these people are going through no negotiations, and you can't see this, but this basically is like the Minister of Finance, uh, Ambassador Hakimi, is the lead negotiator for them, and ours was Ambassador Warlick. Okay, so you have Minister of Finance, Minister of Interior, Minister of Defense, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I can't see those other ones. Okay, so those all those guys and gals sit across the table from these gals, and what you had there was you had you had the ambassador in Kabul, you had the lead negotiator, Mr. Warlick, you had Major General McFarland, you had Mr. John Hill of OSD. You had Miss Mitchell of the State Department. You had OGC, Office of Government Counsel. Uh, you had the political and military advisor in the embassy in Kabul. You had uh, three other Army officers. You had Captain Scott Lohr, who was the LEGAD, legal advisor for the BSA. So he was the lawyer who advised on to the commander, General Dunford, giving him his own advice, his <coughs> own lawyer on that document. You had uh, Colonel Zemp. And you had another colonel in there that were part of J-5. In an Army staff, your J-5 basically talks about civil affairs, talks about operating within the population. So these guys would come and talk about, hey, this is what the Afghans are thinking, or this is what Afghan society is, this is what the culture is, and this is what you need to understand. And all of those people were on that negotiating team. So you have all of these people, and they get together, and they do their little negotiations, and then they take a break, or why it's going on, what they do then is they go to subject matter experts. So they come to subject matter experts and they say, how does customs and taxes work in Afghanistan? Or how does the Uniform Code of Military Justice work? Or how do you take jurisdiction over a contractor and civilian and take them back to the states and try them in a federal court? How do you do all those things? You know, how do you equip the Afghan army? How does that all work? How does uh, the airspace work? How do you do that together? So all of those things, they talk to SMEs, and they're talking about all those different things that I talked about before. Freedom of movement, taxes, customs, uh, how you're going to go about and get, uh, how you move about Afghanistan freely, driver's licenses, all those things. They go and they talk about to subject matter experts, then they go back into negotiations, they edit the document, okay, then it goes around and around, you have a whole bunch of meetings, and it goes for four rounds. So that's the process. Okay. So what's in the BSA? All right. There's a whole lot of stuff in the bilateral security agreement. All right. And remember, the SPA is our base document for the BSA. And so you have all these things. You have the definition. You have the purpose and the scope. And when I spoke in the beginning, I talked about what the purpose and the scope of the document was. And you have all these things. You have the laws, developing and sustaining Afghanistan, use of agreed facilities, motor vehicles, taxation, entry and exit, claims, annexes. You have all these different articles, okay, that you are governed by, both sides are governed by, how you're going to operate in Afghanistan come January of 2014. So we're not going to go through all of them. We'd be here forever. So we're just going to hit the ones that I think are really critical and really important. And if you have any questions on any article, uh, just please let me know and you can do that. So these are the ones I think uh, are important. And here, you, this, is, uh, this is Karzai holding up the BSA and telling everybody he's not going to sign it. Okay, so Article 4 is basically developing and sustaining Afghan def defense uh, capabilities. So what that means is we are going to train, equip, Okay, Afghanistan. Afghanistan says in Article 4, eventually we will pay for our own army. But in reality, what Article 4 also says is the U.S. government, okay, along with ISAF, but ISAF's not part of this, but they'll come in under their own NATO SOFA, is 
we'll fund that army and we'll equip that army, we'll train that army until Afghanistan can stand on its own two feet and uh, carry out its own security. So that's what uh, Article 4 means. External aggression. This is what I think is really the root. Oh, sorry. This is what I think is really the root is the external aggression. What uh, President Karzai, if you read in the news, what he is always after is protection from external forces, whether it's Pakistan, uh, whether it's the Russians. He basically, I believe, my own personal opinion is that he wants a mutual uh, pack of, of uh, like NATO, like an alliance with the U.S. that if someone attacks us, you will come to our aid. And in this article, it basically talks about how we will work together to address any aggressive behavior to, to us using the diplomatic, uh, economics, the military, and, and political, uh, what's known as dime, uh, political aspects out in the world to deter aggression against us. And so they agree to that. The movement of vehicles and vessels and aircraft. Basically, in order to conduct operations, we have to be able to move when we want and where we want in order to conduct not only advise and assist and train, but also to carry out counterterrorism missions. Um, so that's very important that you have that in a bilateral security agreement or a SOFA. The next thing is the status of personnel. There are places where you argue over whether you have uh, jurisdiction exclusive or concurrent jurisdiction. You both have jurisdiction or they'll have jurisdiction. So this is pretty key. In our agreement, we have exclusive jurisdiction over our forces and over our civilian component, which is our DOD people who accompany us in the force. So that could be like the Corps of Engineers or people who work for the Army uh, for us. Um, entry and exit, which means we can come and go through Afghanistan as we need to conduct our operations. So that is part of it in terms of Article 15. Uh, Article 16 means we can import and export anything that we need in order to carry out our mission. So um, whatever we need to bring in, we can bring in tax-free. Remember, we bring it in tax-free. Whatever we need to get rid of, we can dispose of it how we want to dispose of it in accordance with U.S. environmental laws and their laws. Okay, so we just can't throw it away. Um, so we have to abide by that. But we have the ability to import and export the things that we need tax-free and dispose of them how we see fit. Uh, and finally, I touched on taxation, the joint commissions. The joint commissions is important because as you saw in the MTA, the final arbitrary ar arbiter of that agreement was the commander, General Dunford. Under the bilateral security agreement, it's going to be a joint commission. So if there's a dispute, the two sides, they get together, they meet, and they talk about it, and they discuss how they are going to move forward and resolve these problems, whereas before it was a one-way relationship. Um, I, I believe it's really a two-way relationship now, uh, but it, before, uh, under the agreement, it was a one-way, but now it's, a, it's more, more of a two-way relationship, and there, that's codified in the Joint Commission. So let's do a little bit of history. So we talked about who was the lead negotiator. We talked about the four rounds of negotiations, and then we get basically in June, the negotiations in 2013 were suspended. We're not going to have them anymore. You know, we're done. We walk away from the table. Then in September, uh, the negotiators returned to the table because Afghanistan brought another draft document and said, okay, we're, we're ready to negotiate again. Here's a document. And you had all this huge movement that you saw. You saw uh, Secretary Kerry visit Kabul. Uh, then after that, Karzai made a lot of said, you know, you have to do X, Y, and Z now if I'm going to sign it. I know we agreed to all of this, but I'm going to put further conditions on you signing the BSA. And so the president sent a letter to Karzai, you can pull it off on the internet, and he talks about, hey, look, I, we were going to respect Afghan homes. We're not going to do these type of operations. Uh, we've also spent a lot of blood and treasure in Afghanistan, and we have a lot of nations that want to help you out. That's basically what's in that letter. So please sign the letter. So Karzai says, um, before, <clears throat> before I think it was round two or three, he put a new, a new stipulation was, it has to go to the loyal jirga. Okay, remember, this agreement, you know, this agreement has already been approved by both houses of the parliament in Afghanistan. It's already been approved. They already say, sign away. And Karzai says, nope, I'm sending it to the loyal jirga. 
And so they have the loyal jerga. The loyal chairman of the loyal jerga says, um, you have to sign it, Karzai. We want you to sign, sign this agreement. He does not. He stands up. He says, I don't want to see it. And just if you think that Afghan uh, people are not anything like American people, one of the conditions for the loyal jerga was that we would put a base in the north. So just like here in America where people want their base and their community because what does it mean? It means money. It means, <laughs> it means taxes. It means growth. You know, it means jobs. And so one of the conditions of the loyal jerga was, hey, you, you got to put, put a base up here in the north for us, you know? So those are the kind of things that are they're like little interesting facts that you, don't, that you don't get from reading the paper. So, uh, so then we come out and we say, uh, we, uh, Karzai says, I'm not signing it. So what does the administration say? The administration says, if you don't sign this agreement, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna just go. We're just going to go home, right? So if you read in the newspaper, that's what basically the administration said. They said, you better sign it by 1 January because we need the plan um, and we're going to go home. So Karzai says, go home. I don't care. Get out of here. We, we, don't, we don't want you here. And so we fold, right? We fold. We say, okay, well, we'll sign it. We'll sign it later. We'll work with you. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little sarcasm, but if that's what's in the newspapers as you read it. I mean, that's what happened. <clears throat> so Karzai says he's going to sign it in April. Uh, the intelligence director, James Clapper, says, yeah, he's not going to sign it, right? That's what he says. That's our intel. He's not going to sign it. India says, remember, you got all these other people in the background. Way to go, Karzai. Don't sign it, right? So Indian parliament or Indian president, prime minister says, way to go. Uh, then he puts on new conditions. The Taliban, you know, you have to enter into negotiations with the Taliban. You know, he may be right. You know, how do you end a war responsibly? Well, you have to end a war with the other side at the negotiating table, and you have to talk to them. Uh, Lindsey Graham says, uh, cut off aid if you let, you know, Karzai, you know, throws even more gasoline on the fire. He says, I'm going to let these 65 people out. I will tell you right now, this is... Uh, these 65, we, we turned over the Bagram detention facility when I was there. And we let out a lot of people. A lot of people got let out and a lot of people went to Afghan prison. And they tried a lot of people. Um, and these 65 people killed 32 U.S. and coalition forces. And they killed 23 Afghan security forces. These are, these are people who should not be out on the street. And I will tell you from my personal experience... The detainee evidence-based capture is just as developed as police work. They do forensic analysis. They take sworn statements. They take photographs. Um, they do, they trace, you know, just like you see on CSI. Okay, we know that this timer was made here and this guy builds these bombs and he uses these certain timers and he gets them from here and we know that he got paid based on the transactions of the money going through the system. It's very sophisticated and it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of great intelligence if you, and, and then they come to trial and these, none of these people who were let out, the evidence is, is, is solid. It's not like in Iraq where in 2003 we went into Iraq and the one thing about the Army and the one thing about history is we don't learn our lessons. And that's one of my big things is you have to study history in order for you not to repeat your mistakes. And we did detainee operations exceptionally well in Kosovo. We biometriced everybody. We took statements from everybody. We knew who everybody was. Uh, we, and uh, and in, when we went into Iraq, we didn't. We went into a village. We rounded everybody up from the age of 14 to 65, and we put them in prison. And that was our detainee operations. So we don't do that anymore, okay? We have a very solid uh, evidence thing, and we put Western standards on it. We say when you're captured within 72 hours, you're going to have a hearing, and we're going to have the evidence. And if we don't have the evidence in 72 hours, we're going to boot you out, okay? So it's, it's a pretty robust process. So when he, he let those 65 people out, that was, that was really kind of a, that was, that was not a nice thing to do. That was a... That was pretty, that was really, okay, five minutes. okay, that was like, that was slapping a lot of people in the face because a lot of soldiers died and a lot of people, um, 
were hurt by these, these guys and when they had the evidence, they could have taken them to Afghanistan, into, into a court. So these are the contentious issues right now. Jurisdiction, aggressive language, counter operations. Um, so those are the, those are the things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. The NATO SOFA, the NATO SOFA is right behind the BSA, the Bilateral Security Agreement. Now just remember, I'll just, uh, uh, you have to take into consideration the 26 countries for the NATO SOFA and the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which the U.S. is not a part of. So basically if there's a war crime, the NATO agrees that we're going to turn our personnel over to the ICC. The U.S. does not. We're not part of that treaty. So we can go into that. And I'm going to end on relationships. <coughs> so there's only one Catholic church in Afghanistan. It's in Kabul. It's at the Italian embassy. Italy was the first country to recognize Afghanistan back in the early 1900s. And so Af Afghanistan asked Italy and said, hey, what can we do for you because you were the first? You were the first people to recognize our sovereignty. And Italy said, let's have a Catholic church in Kabul. And Afghanistan said, you got it. Okay? I've been to Mass here. It's a, it's a pretty church. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a nice setting. Father Marathi. Okay? Father Marathi has been shot. He's had shrapnel in him. Okay? He's been there since 1979. <clears throat> so this Catholic church with the Little Sisters of Mercy runs schools. They provide charity. And remember, you can't preach Christianity in Kabul or in Afghanistan. It's against the law. You could be put, you know, you can be put to, into prison and you can be sentenced to death. Okay, so you got to remember that these people have been there for over a hundred years. They have this relationship through good and through bad, through being wounded, and they've managed to basically be well respected within the community and have this relationship with Afghanistan. So my point is, if we're going to have a relationship with Afghanistan and we're going to see things through, you know, you go through ups and downs, <clears throat> you go through good times and bad times, and, um, you know, that's basically my point, you know, if, if, uh, if you carry on and you, and you move through it and you, and you stick to it, uh, hopefully they'll have a, uh, you know, everything will be okay in the end, but, you know, who knows? If you leave, you know, it could end up okay also, but that's my point. Uh, I'll take any questions that you have. Can you talk about the uh, issue of troop immunity? I know it was a big discussion in Iraq and there was a lot of contention around that. Has it been the same contention in Afghanistan? Right. A lot of people confuse immunity with jurisdiction. Immunity means, and the Afghans think this, immunity means that if you do something wrong, you are not going to get in trouble where jurisdiction is, and it's basically an education process, exclusive jurisdiction or concurrent jurisdiction um, basically means that, that you know, the U.S. or Afghanistan will take jurisdiction over the person and, and uh, try them. There is no such thing as immunity for any soldier uh, over there. So there, there is a confusion, and, and I think we've gotten through that, and they understand that, but that is a hard concept to get to, to talk about because that's what people do believe. They do believe that if soldiers do something, they're going to be immune, and they're going to get away with it. So, yes, ma'am. How, how do you explain, the, <clears throat> sorry, how do you explain the, the fact that the Karzai won't sign the BSA, and maybe in the context of Iraq and, what was it, 2011, refusing to sign as well? I mean, it doesn't seem to be politics, right, because all the political elites are on the side of signing. It doesn't seem to be economics, because... Afghanistan is a more advantageous position at the science. It doesn't seem to be security or defense, because obviously it would be in the United States too. So, so how do you explain what seems to be a conundrum? I, as being, having lived behind the scenes on all of these different issues where you think the President Karzai is on board and you're moving in the right direction, even when we were turning over the Parwan detention facility, and he would do something out of the extraordinary that would just throw every, you know, turn the apple cart over, he would do it time and time again. I, I just have no idea why. I mean, um, everyone believes that it will get signed, uh, but not with uh, President Karzai in power. So I, I just don't understand why he won't. I mean, I just, he, ha he has everything. I mean, he's, uh, we've provided him with untold 
uh, monetary and, and uh, equipment and, and, and support. So it's not like we haven't given a, a complete effort. So, yes, sir. Uh, would you please say that what are the uh, present kind of the condition for the BSA as you mentioned this? I'm sorry? Please. Would you tell us important details about present kind of the conditions for the BSA? Sure. I mean, it is unclear yet for the fund people. They don't know what are the present kind of conditions. Okay. The jurisdiction, he wants to have more jurisdiction over other personnel, so he doesn't want to have exclusive jurisdiction. He wants to have concurrent jurisdiction maybe over certain persons. So maybe contractors, maybe civilian component. You can have the soldier, but I want some of those other people for Afghan sovereignty. If you do something wrong, we want to take control of people who accompany the force. Aggressive language, he wants more language that says if we're attacked, you're going to come to our aid. Okay, that's a contention. We want to water that down because we're allies with Pakistan. You know, we don't, we don't want to enter into that. Uh, we don't want to choose sides. Counterterrorism operations, CT operations, that's a contention. Uh, we have to be able to go into certain places and take down bad people who are designated enemies of the United States. So they're targets. And, uh, you know, it's killer capture. And so we have to do certain things, and he doesn't want us to be able to do certain things in order to carry that out. Entering mosques, mosques and detaining people, he doesn't want us to detain anybody anymore. So it has to be the Afghans. Sometimes, uh, right now, we do partner with the Afghans and the special forces. I will tell you, I will tell you just on a side note, the Afghan army is getting hit hard, and a lot of them are dying and wounding. They're fighting hard, and the special forces for Afghanistan are doing a great job. But we partner with those guys, and when we can, they will enter the they will enter the house and they will take down that person. But Sometimes in that rare circumstance, we have to be able to do that, and he doesn't want us to be able to do that at all. Um, pro prohibiting of Afghan homes, searching of Afghan homes. Uh, you know, I can understand that, uh, but sometimes we must be able to do that, and he doesn't want us to do that at all. And so that's a, a contention. We say we would like to, in the rare exceptional circumstances, we would like to, by ourselves and not with the Afghans, and he says not at all. So do the U.S. want that in a joint operation or, or, or an independent operation? We want that. You want that, I mean, with we, the U.S. We, with the Afghan army? or We want say? exclusive jurisdiction. We want to be able to do what we want to do in order to carry out our operations. We don't want permission. We're going we're gonna to respect Afghan sovereignty. We're going to respect the Afghan law. But in those cases, we need to be able to do what we need to be able to do in order to protect our national interest. And so that's the rub. And you can understand it. It's their country. You know, we're operating in their home. You know, just think if somebody was operating in your home, you know, in your country, knocking on your house. So, you know, you can understand all of these things. No. Well, sorry, we got to cut it short. we got a class coming in. But uh, very informative talk. Uh, just let's give a hand to our...